So I'm going to begin the recording. Fix your hair, Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. Um, and real quick, Julie, for your benefit, I'm late on the recording, but we are gathering here together and we're beginning with a question uh, to consider, a question Michelle and I have been wrestling over the past 40 days in our Jesus 2020 conversations. Um, one to come back to as we move forward from this space, um, the question, what does it mean to think about our politics, whatever they may be, theologically, or stated perhaps a little differently, how do we hold our personal political convictions together with the convictions that we, had, we, we claim and hold to as members of a community that proclaims the life and the teachings of Jesus Christ? How do we hold these two sets of convictions together? And do they always match up? How do, how do they talk to each other? How do they talk to us? And so that really is the framing question I want to, want to uh, offer y'all and invite you maybe to, to share uh, some reflection, share some thoughts that you might have as, as we begin our conversation today. Kit. So I think of um, uh, my daughter Stella is in school in uh, Chicago and she was um, signed on to make calls to uh, registered Democrats in Wisconsin that um, to just get out the vote. Um, so it was supposed to, you know, be, supposed to be friendlies, <laughs> but it wasn't. <laughs> and she got some people that really berated her just for asking. Um, it was, a, and it was an interesting experience. And then she, and then she finally got this one woman who said, "Oh, Biden Harris, I love them," and just got so excited. And so I was like, "Yay, you know, a live one." And she hadn't voted yet, so she, you know, they had this conversation. And then it still gets to the point of like, "Great." And so I just want to encourage you to get out to vote. And the woman said, "Oh well, I mean, it's in God's hands." You know, that we have no control, <laughs> you know, and she was like, ah, so she tried to pull, well, my mom's on the vestry, <laughs> but it really spoke to me, like how, what, how, where your faith c comes into play when it comes to politics, how, how do you, how, do, how, how people will approach that in, in different ways, and, um, uh, I was wishing that she'd had some of the conversations that that we that we've been having of, of where where do you where do you put where do you put your faith and and like you have to take your your beliefs into into your vote into your politics and into caring for each other um, how how could you how could you separate the two uh, but then and I mean I came down to maybe that 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 person does that generally maybe she doesn't in her daily life think she has an impact either but I would hope she does and I, I have a feeling I'm like on the street her Christian values are probably palpable so so what's the disconnect with when you when you're voting and so it's just sharing a story thank you for that kit I think that's that's very helpful and it echoes your story echoes some comments that I've heard and it will not surprise you at all being good faithful St. Mark's members, um, some of you for many years, um, that not everyone was uh, pleased with this conversation. <laughs> that the thought that um, we would be talking politics uh, in church uh, bothers some and you know I'll be candid. There was a long time for me um, when politics and church bothered me because the uh, rector of my home parish in Montgomery, Alabama, uh, talked politics that I particularly was not comfortable with. Um, and so, you know, that, I think it raises an interesting question, Kit, you know, how, how do we talk about these things in a way that is open and inviting and that has a posture of listening and learning? So I appreciate that story. Well, the thing that occurred to me is you, when you, the first question you asked didn't get me to kind of what I'm going to say until you rephrased it. But I, 
for me, um, not so much spe specific politics, but I think the, that what my faith tells me or kind of where, where I am is that our politics should be about the community and everybody. And I feel like so much of the conversation is about what do I, what are my individual rights? What do I want to do? And nobody, nobody has a right to tell me I can't do what I want to do. And I don't see that in the Bible. And I don't, you know, I mean, Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. And I just don't get, <laughs> I just don't get this other perspective. I don't understand. I, I mean, it's, it's just not, not me. And well, I mean, I certainly have my own selfishness, I guess, and maybe from my own privileged perspective, there are lots of things that I don't even think about that other people might be concerned about for themselves individually. But I just feel like this focus on what are my rights and I can carry a gun anywhere I want to and nobody has a right to even be concerned about that much, let's tell me not to do it. And I just, I have a real problem with that. Mm. So, thank you, Andrew. And that does get at one of the questions that that I was hoping we could we could struggle with a little bit. You know, the divide that we're seeing in our country after this election um, sin, seems to be, you know, it seems to be manifesting itself politically but it it's manifesting itself in a way that really centers on the individual versus everyone else um and i think you hit that well andrew and i'm curious how how you all might see the past election cycle revealing uh a fundamental disagreement in the united states about what our responsibilities are to our neighbor. And um, as, we, as we think about that, is that a way we can talk about our politics and our faith together? You know, Andrew, uh, you made me, uh, th with, with your uh, comments, you made me think, um, it's not me the people, it's we the people. Mm -hmm. Or as Patricia Arquette said, it's not we the partial people when she was lamenting the state of women and inclusion in her own kind of movie world, but in, in the nation. And um, as for your last question, uh, the most recent one you just asked, I find that I have to get out of my head and to my heart. And where, where, that, where that takes me is, is uh, to again Andrew's point about community, and and I think wearing a mask is about community, and I think this my rights my rights point that you know, no uh, it's about being um, it's about love your neighbor it's you know I also worship at the Church of Fred Rogers, and I I try hard and fail. But I try again. I wipe myself off after I'm either mumbling under my breath something dreadful about uh, really annoying people or whatever. Even people I love, I sometimes mumble unkindly under my breath. <laughs> I confess here, it's terrible. But I know what I'm called to do. And it, and it really is quite simple um, that I am called to love others. And I get tested by my sister-in-law, whom I love, who was, was a big Trump supporter. And I have, we've created a space where in caring for Charlie's uh, stepfather, my father-in-law, that we can be together and, and hold each other up in love. So that's what I'm, it's on my mind now. Thank you, Louise. I, I think, one of the things that's become really clear for me, and this is after years of preaching through many political battles all over the con all over 
well, a state and a district, um, that I was in a very conservative town doing an interimship um, to try and uh, write a church that was in trouble. And I was preaching and I was told very clearly that they, um, there were people there who didn't appreciate me um, preaching planks of the Democratic Party. And I was like, oh, well, actually, that's not that. It's the gospel. It's Jesus. And I, I was really taken aback by it. Um, because I think that what does the theology, theology words about God, say to you about the way that you act in the world, which is politics? Um, you know, and for some of us who are on this call, um, it's really clear when someone says, oh, I'm not political. And I'm like, and you can afford not to be because no one's ever voted on your rights. Nobody's ever, ever voted on your human rights. You can afford to be not political. Um, so I, I think it's really an interesting thing. And what I've realized in this conversation with Joe over the last 40 days is that um, the politics of Jesus breaking into the world and calling for a new way to be in the world um, aligns with what I, I guess are planks in the Democratic Party. Um, but I know my evangelical friends would say their view of the world, Jesus is lined up very deeply with what they believe. And, and I think it's a real hard parse if one of the ways that we talk about the public and our moral status, our moral stature, is so deeply tied up in what we perceive Jesus to be. And I think that's where we kind of run into each other um, pretty deeply. And I don't know how to unpick that divide. So, hmm. does anybody else have any thoughts, Chuck? Okay, yeah. One of the things that gets to me is how people of different religions have sometimes very different political views as well. I mean, like, I've gone to churches, well, not Episcopal churches, it's been other things that have taken me to other churches, that I run into people who are sometimes, in our current frame of view, very conservative, and others very, very liberal. And they quote, they quote, Jesus Christ is supporting their views, whether it be conservative or liberal or socialist or whatever. And I'm wondering how much thinking do, are these people doing with regard to this? I know my own political views, shall we say, can be very complicated. Like when you talk about libertarian stuff, I have, shall we say, very libertarian views on things like the god-awful drug war <laughs> and uh, a few other things like that. But I can also see the benefit of government helping us to do things that we haven't done before. This might be the space geek of me coming out. In other words, we can do things together providing we do it in an open, caring, democratic fashion. I'm very much not in favor of authoritarian politics, whatever the uh, political views are. Anyhow, and I can share with you some other libertarian views on things like the drug war, uh, drinking alcohol. Those are some personal things that I can share with you that you would be very surprised at. So thank you very much. And now I'm gonna mute myself again. I will unmute myself when I have something to say, or even if it's only a reply to something else that someone has else to say. Okay, take care. Thank you, Chuck. And I'd like to share with you guys um, a quote from this book. If you can see it, it's Obrey Hendricks, uh, The Politics of Jesus. And Michelle and I read through some of it. I'll be honest, I didn't get through all of it. It's a very lengthy book. Um, and I guess if I had nothing else to read in, in seminary, I might have cleared it. Um, but it is an intriguing uh, take on the politics of Jesus. And if this is a topic that interests you, I commend it. 
uh, to you. In the meantime, um, I would like to offer, uh, see if I can do this. Um, I'd like to offer this with you and I'm, I'm going to hope that this share screen works. Um, and I'm going to ask, uh, let's see, uh, Carol, I don't know. Uh, would you be willing to read this first section here? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes, Jesus of Nazareth was a political revolutionary. To say that Jesus was a political revolutionary is to say that the message he proclaimed not only called for change in individual hearts, but also demanded sweeping and comprehensive change in political, social, and economic structures in his settings of life, colonized Israel. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Um, what do y'all think about that? I, I, uh, I'd like to, I, I kind of think the statement fits in. I've been struggling here what to say because I find it hard to be in a democracy and for anyone to say that they're not political because we are in a democracy. So we're all participating in a de in democratic government. And to not participate is also a type of political. So much of what we do is tied to political, whether we use the word political or not. And so much of the way we, so much of the way I think and I feel uh, and establish my own personal priorities come out of the moral values that were instilled in me by my family my church, my education, and the community in which I'm living now. And I guess I haven't thought of it as a theology. I'm just, it's, it's just a part of me. And it, it certainly affects the way I choose political priorities that are offered by the various parties or by the various candidates uh, or by the various uh, individuals who are holding political office. And to, I don't feel I do it enough. I did it when I was younger, I was more active. Uh, I not advocated on causes that I deeply believed in. I feel like I've kind of quieted down, but, um, we we need to hold our uh, political leaders and those we've elected with, from local state to federal responsible for those moral values that or our theology that we that we hold true and so how do we do this we can't do everything but we pick priorities in our own individual lives and we watch those persons and speak out or or march or go visit their office or whatever to, we need to hold them accountable. I've been thinking recently, I'm watching to see what there's a task force. I don't know the name of the task force, but there's a task force is that the mayor had formed that the uh, in, involving reforms for the DC police. And they're supposed to make a report before the end of this year. And I, I'm kind of watching for the local news and so forth of what is going to be contained within that report. What recommendations are they going to make? Uh, because I'm just interested to see which direction they're going to go and, and will our elected local officials, what, uh, what positions in the council and the mayor's office will they take on those recommendations? That's kind of just like a specific um, example that's on my mind right now. Thank you, Carol. Thank you. <laughs> Any other thoughts? Do y'all agree? I mean, do y'all agree with Hendrix here?
I completely agree. I feel for everything that's been raised up um, uh, and amplified and where they're so on social justice and uh, um, issues that have touched such a huge number of the population of, of, of wanting to, of having greater awareness of why some problems exist and how they are systemic and, and how the, the great length of history. Well, that's, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. But the revolutionary part is going to be implementing change. And, and that's going to be really hard. And it's going to, and it's going to cause a lot of sacrifice and, um, and, and make things maybe uh, not as, as easy for, for everyone. And, um, and so that's where um, coming down to a place of love is going to be so important. And, uh, you know, I mean, as it's, it's some, some of you know, I'm, that, you know, I'm connected to Washington Interfaith Network, exploring this opportunity of blank public land, going to be developed um, down by RFK. Well, that's, that's a huge opportunity. It's not just, oh, well, there should be this many number of affordable housing units. It's much bigger than that, right? I mean, it's, it's um, jobs, but even just the fact of getting those housing units. How do you um, make the rest of the neighborhood comfortable with that? And what are their fears going to be? And what are their concerns going to be? And, and, and what are the needs in the community? And even when you start to create spaces like that, they're, that's, they're not a, a solution. Uh, they're, they're, there's a lot of support and, and education change and job change. I mean, it's, just a, it's just many, many pieces that are going to be required to, to make something like this work. And, and it's got to come from a place of, why are we doing this and why do we care about this um, because we recognize that there's a need to love and care for a greater number of people in our community that have not been get, had these opportunities but there's going to be so much to overcome it's it's going to be revolutionary to create this kind of change and um and, there, and there's a lot of exploration of those things now but and they're and they're revolutionary they're not to change the system, <laughs> that's revolutionary. That's, that's the quote. Mm. Thank you, Kit. Kit, you um, gave me some clarity and maybe helped me frame putting something in the chat, help me frame this idea of holding our politics together with our uh, faith convictions um, as a distinction, uh, hang on, as, as a distinction, not between competing convictions, uh, but as maybe understanding, you know, our faith convictions as the content of our political convictions. And so I'm, I'm curious what happens when we frame the question as maybe, maybe you just did for us, Kit. What, you know, what is it that our political convictions hold for us? What is the substance, the core, that our political policy positions uh, hold for us? Is it capitalism? Is it, um, is it a, a white picket fence? Um, a chicken in every pot? I mean, like, what is it? Um, I guess it doesn't have to be our personal faith convictions, but perhaps it could be. You know, um, content of my politics, you make me think of the source of my politics and I have to go back to to being a kid and of all the rebellions I had and there were many it was not a political rebellion because because my my parents especially my mother whom I had a tortured relationship with for many years she had such beauty in her convictions because she telegrammed Martin Luther King she marched she she saw she was so generous with 
um, you know, my friends who were suffering, one in particular, and she was uh, really a model for me. And my father was less active than she was, but she was really active and she really tried to love her neighbors and tried to, to, to set herself right. Her own mother had abandoned her as a child and she tried to, to be the best she could be um, in the political sense, the content, I'm, I'm sort of rambling here, but I just want, it, you just took me back to the source. Where was it shaped? Where was it formed? And I'm indebted to them for that, the sense of social justice. I spent a good part of my life in the labor movement, as many of you know, which certainly for all of its flaws stands, stands solidly behind, around, all the issues around social justice, at least in their best moments. Thank you, Louise. Joe, I hate to put you on the spot, but I have a question for you, because um, you read more of that book than I did. Um, it strikes me that there's so much in um, the Hebrew Bible about welcoming a stranger. There is so much about um, Jesus reaching out across divides mm -hmm. and saying, the scripture is fulfilled with my presence here. Um, our evangelical brothers and sisters who have supported Donald Trump and supported um, a mo modality of saying all lives matter and yet um, we've separated families um, and that we've put, um, you know, I hate saying kids in cages because I don't know if that's like, is that real? You know what I mean? Like that's such a hot button way of doing it, but they've separated families and they put children in one place and adults in another. And um, they act as though that this is somehow within um, Jesus's realm. And I, it's one of the ways that I really struggle trying to have a faith conversation in the body politic when I hear people justifying that through what they're taught. Do you have any thoughts about that? Or did uh, uh, Hendricks have any thoughts about the way that the, uh, the right of center Christians view the world um, that Jesus was calling forth in their own personal politics? Sure. And, and, Michelle, that's a, that's a good question, and it actually, I, I I hope this is responsive to the question. I'd like to share with you all the next quote from Hendricks uh, as a way just to begin to to take your question, Michelle, and to try and uh, turn a bit to Hendricks and and maybe respond through that light. Um, Andrew, would you be so kind as to read the second? Paragraph for me. Most Christians will tolerate imputing radical, spiritual, and relational intentions to Jesus. But when you go past the realm of individual piety and say that he actively opposed the oppressive political structures of his time and counseled others to do the same, you've gone too far. Thank you. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I kind of offer that to you all um, as a way to think about the different ways the words of Jesus are instrumentalized and rationalized. Um, and Michelle, I'm looking uh, directly into your lap. I'm not sure that's intended. Uh, I don't need to I, see I, your text. I want to keep pedaling, sorry. And I'm trying to figure out how many miles I've ridden there today, so... I didn't want to watch your texts. Um, you know, oh, you might... yeah, I haven't put in anything real embarrassing. I appreciate you stopping me from that, so thank you. Well, I, th I thought you might be trying to help me out. I didn't want them to see where I was getting all my good ideas. No, 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 no. Um, thank you. Thank you for no. keeping me out of trouble. I'll just turn my video off for a second while I make a decision. All good. It, it, I'm listening. Yeah, so, um, you know, we all know people like this, right? People who say, oh, well, you know, Jesus really didn't um, really didn't mean that we overthrow 
government, right? He, surely he didn't mean that. I mean, because Paul says that, you know, we ought to honor our civil authorities. Um, and, you know, surely, you know, surely what Jesus is talking about is all metaphor. Um, and I don't know that they say that, but, but they act, a lot of folks will act that way, that when Jesus is talking in a revolutionary manner, you know, that's not consistent with the lily white Jesus hanging on their wall, right? Um, consistent with this, this meek and mild Jesus. Um, and so they, a lot of folks I know think about Jesus as calling for spiritual reform, right? We need, because it's all about sin. It's all about how wicked we are as human beings and We've got to have a revolution inside ourselves so we can get the golden ticket to heaven. And it's got, you know, we just got to bear it out, grit it out and endure this life because, you know, we're all going to draw a bad card one day. And uh, if we can do that and have our spiritual revolution, Jesus promises us uh, that that glass elevator will take us up to the candy factory in the sky. Right. I mean, like we all know people, who want to make Jesus and, and confine Jesus to a purely spiritual context. And I, I think that's what Hendricks is pushing back against uh, when he's talking about uh, limiting the radical spiritual and relational intentions of Jesus to individual piety. And, um, and so, you know, to answer your question, Michelle, um, how do we talk? How do we talk to people who fundamentally understand the words of Jesus differently? And, and and I don't know that that's an answer to a question so much as a question in and of itself. But I'm curious. You know, you guys have been at this a whole lot. Some of you a lot longer than me. Um, don't want to date myself or you, uh, Carol. I see you jumping at the bit. Well, I wanted to say that. The, uh, some of the, my family that were evangelical, I find myself, it's hard to have conversations because they have a degree of certitude. They are certain without any doubts about subjects which, about which I am not certain and have doubts. And so when I put myself in a position of talking to people who have no doubts, then it's hard to have open discussions because certain subjects have been shut down you can't there's no there's no other but one side on those subjects mm -hmm. i've had that experience <laughs> i think we all have thank you <laughs> and it feels like though what you're saying too is kind of right back to the my concern is that it's all focused on the individual i mean if if my whole faith is about me getting me to heaven and deserving to get there, then I'm like, I got this real narrow range of what I'm focused on. And it doesn't involve helping anybody else or anybody else at all. It's all about me taking care of myself. And again, it's like, that's not what the Bible or Jesus says to me at all. If it's, if it's due unto others as you would have them do unto you, and that's further back even than Jesus. So it's like, I feel like what am I missing that you know that's other it seems to be the only focus it's helpful Andrew I was I was thinking um that the sort of milk toast sappy Jesus that I remember as being introduced to as a kid or at least I thought it was certainly not the fired up revolutionary that I I really treasure. And so I, you know, it's, it's sort of scary, but it's, it's, cause it's a call not to sit this one out, this life of ours, this faith of ours. We don't get, you know, that's not optional. You know, if you're a Christian, you know, you don't. So, so um, I'm, I'm very grateful for the call to be a revolutionary and, and again, loving your neighbor, uh, is a is is pretty revolutionary when you think about it um, and i have to say that i also 
my favorite bumper sticker, religious bumper sticker, and it's sassy, but it's, I don't know, and you don't either. <laughs> and uh, I got a kick out of that uh, because that speaks to the certitude that Carol was talking about. And it, it just, I love it. It's kind of a nice punch back so much for loving other views. But um, I, I just made me think of that. Thanks. That's it. Self and Louise, thank you. And there's something holy about mystery, isn't there? I mean, so in Rite One, and I know that St. Mark's probably hasn't done Rite One Eucharist in what, 100 years? But 50, I, I, I don't know. Anyway, um, you know, in the right one Eucharistic liturgy, uh, the the uh, the sacramental elements are referred to uh, in the Eucharist as the holy mysteries, and and that that's kind of a frame that that's that's a frame that I approach all all knowledge all knowledge about God about the divine is holy mystery. And it's something for me that, that I can only ever approach. I don't ever arrive. I don't know that anyone ever arrives. And so, Louise, I, I appreciate um, the, the reflection. Andrew, I, I agree, you know, that, that the level of certitude some folks have, I think, may say more about them than it does about Jesus. And I wonder, I wonder about that. Well, and I also think, though, Joe, that one of the one of the big problems is that the church needs to do its work to help people uh, have the way to go form questions around Jesus. I mean, if if I don't question it, Jesus is me, man. Everything that I want and dream and hope for the entire world is Jesusy as it can be. Let's put it that way, right? Um, so if we just take whole cloth what the church teaches us, um, we end up in a place where Jesus looks a lot like our pastor. Jesus looks a lot like ourselves. Jesus looks a lot like our desires. Jesus looks a lot like the Democratic Party. Jesus looks a lot like the legalized pot now party. You know, that's, and that's not it. And the truth of the matter is, and Joe Tarantolo said this to me in sermon seminar, and I've heard it before because um, it's usually paraphrased right before someone tells me they didn't like my sermon, um, but that's not what he did. But usually that's what I hear. I hear this quote from Jim Adams constantly when people are pretty much telling me they didn't like my sermon, which is, you know, Jim Adams only considered a sermon, um, a good sermon if 30% of the people loved it, 30% of the people uh, didn't like it at all, and 30% of the people um, didn't know how they felt about it. I, I don't know, 10% apparently abstained from that, that, that thing. Um, but if I preach a sermon and it makes you feel safe and warm and, and, and cozy and it's not Christmas Eve, I don't think I'm doing my job. And I don't, I think that Jesus should make me a little nervous. And Jesus should make me a little anxious because he's going to always keep calling for more for me. Mm. And, and that's, and that's the thing. So, you know, the dead certitude that I have that I'm following Jesus's path, I think is as dangerous as my evangelical brothers and sisters, my siblings in Christ who believe the same thing. Um, and if you all just got on the same program, we'd all be good. Uh, that's a dangerous and that's, I mean, I always got the feeling Jesus came in and said, okay, guys, this, and they all went, okay, and then he went, um, and this, and they're like, oh, not so much, and then he's like, yes, and now I'm in a sweet spot, right, mm -hmm. so I, I just really think that if, if our politicians aren't asking for more from us, if our sense of Jesus isn't asking for more from us, why are we doing it, and maybe that's just way too radical for most people, I don't know. You know, I mean, there's, there was the social gospel a hundred and hundred or so years ago, liberation theology, all these things that have, there's constant pushback against the, I mean, within the church, there's constant, there is continual pushback against the, hey, I'm arrived, I'm doing good, don't bother me anymore. 
mm. whether that's your mainline, you know, First Baptist Church or whether that's evangelical or wherever that gets expressed, but there's always, there is always this other current of it going on um, that tries to look to the broader world and what's our responsibility to our community, not just for, for ourselves and our own little spiritual community. Mm. And, and there's a certain level of like, you know, like I talked to friends of mine who were like, yeah, everybody's really happy at my church and, you know, pledges are up this year. And I'm like, that must be lovely. But I think I'd be really bored. I mean, y'all can be pains in my butt, but you challenge me every single day. And I learn something new every single day. And isn't that why we're here? You know, mm -hmm. I mean, I would love a vacation every now and then, which I don't worry about it, but it, it's a gift. It's a gift to be challenged. And speaking of challenge, um, I think, I think Andrew and Michelle, what you're pointing at is that, that, that wrestling of what is the content, right? What is the content of, of these, these convictions we hold politically or economically or policy wise. And I'd like to share with you all, um, something in our scriptures and our friend Paul writes what he, I think he's describing his content, what he describes his content to be based upon the life and the teachings of this Jesus guy. And he's sharing this with people to, to, to help them grapple with that thing too. And I'd like to share that with you all. And um, maybe we can start having this conversation specifically in light of of these convictions. And this is uh, from the message paraphrase. Uh, I'm gonna share it here. And Kit, I'm gonna ask if you would be so kind. Uh, should I start at the top? Please. Uh, love from the center of who you are. Don't fake it. Run for dear life from evil. Hold on for dear life to good. Be good friends who love deeply. Practice playing second fiddle. Don't burn out. Keep yourselves fueled and aflame. Be alert servants of the master, cheerfully expectant. Don't quit in hard times, pray all the harder. Help needy Christians. Be inventive in hospitality. Bless your enemies. No cursing under your breath. <laughs> Uh, laugh with your happy friends when they're happy. Share tears when they're down. Get along with each other. Don't be stuck up. Make friends with nobodies. Don't be the great somebody. Don't hit back. Discover beauty in everyone. If you've got it in you, get along with everybody. Don't insist on getting even. That's not for you to do. I'll do the judging, says God. I'll take care of it. Our scriptures tell us that if you see your enemy hungry, go buy that person lunch, or if he's thirsty, get him a drink. Your generosity will surprise him with goodness. Don't let evil get the best of you. Get the best of evil by doing good. Thank you. Thank you. So, I'm going to submit to you, friends, that for me, that is as good a summation of um, the content of the convictions of the life that Jesus calls us to in his teachings and his life. Um, and, and, and for me, it's a standard. I constantly fail to meet, constantly fail to meet. Um, but if it's something, if I had to point to something that said, you know, I'm going to judge my politicians, I'm going to judge my own actions, I'm going to judge, you know, the standards by which I hold my convictions. If I had to have a standard for those convictions, it would be that. Um, and I share that with you not to say that it should be your the content of your um convictions 
but to ask you, how does the content of your convictions measure up to Paul's? Can you put it up again? Sure, here we go. I can think of the challenges I face trying to live into this and it's and it's where I feel it's it's easiest for me to fail um, and it's that simultaneous um, caring for others and love your neighbors as you would yourself and I and I always like that twist of love your neighbors as they would want to be loved and and I think that's the important part because it's so um, particularly coming from uh, a place of privilege when you are in a position to be able to to offer a lot of help and make a difference um, to to not be doing that in a way that isn't simultaneously treating your neighbor as they would want to be treated that that if you you think you know how to help you think you know what they need you think if I do this, 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 is, this will be what will help. And, and I, the small experience I had my first job out of college is in New York, paralegal in a law firm and walking down the street to get my lunch. And I saw this woman um, that's asking for money. And I'm like, well, I don't want to give her money because I don't know what she's going to do with it. But she's asking for money for food. So, so I, I bought like a second of my lunch and I, and I offered it to her. And she's like, oh, I don't like that. And I was like, what? <laughs> you know? I'm like, well, that's, that's not helping her. You know, if she was hungry, ask her what she wants to eat. Mm. Ask her if, if there's something I could get her that would be helpful to her. Don't think that I know what the, what the answer is. And, and it's, very, it's very easy to do that. And um, uh, so it's how to live into that uh, while keeping those two pieces. You know, when you read this kit, I loved it. And mm. now I'm looking at it again and I'm feeling two things overwhelmed and it's like the to-do list that I never get through but it's also um it's the reminder of maybe start somewhere keep your eye on a couple of things and once you once I feel okay with with where I'm at in some of it then I can also move on because otherwise you're sort of breathless um anyway it's interesting, kid. I was in a, uh, a gathering of um, church people, um, uh, ecumenical uh, lunch group in my very first job, which not that I'm bitter, but they wouldn't let me sit at a table with anyone else. I had to sit by myself. Um, it was like literally i would walk in and i'd be like oh can i sit here and they're like oh we're expecting someone so i would end up sitting in a, like a table for eight by myself and everybody else would have space at their table but they wouldn't let the gay kid sit with them and we had this conversation and the exact same thing happened to one of the ministers um a methodist woman and she was pissed She's like, well, how dare she turn me down? And that's the last time I buy anything for anyone. So, I mean, getting bumped up against someone saying, oh, yeah, that's, uh, I don't eat meat. It's like, well, you're living on the street. You don't get to choose, you know? Like, I, I have peanut butter and jelly in the office. Not right now because I've eaten it all. But I used to, you know, if someone came looking for money for hunger, I'd be like, I can make you peanut PB and J. Sorry, that's what I've got. Um, and you know, one guy said to me, man, that's all people ever offer me. I'm like, well, let's go get a slice of pizza then, you know, but it was just like, why, you know, we made the same bologna and, and American cheese sandwiches for great patrol all the time or a PB and J. Right. And it's like, I'd be real sick of if PB and J was the only thing I could eat too. And for us as Christians to be inventive in hospitality, what a what a crazy notion. And so you you didn't shut down by that experience. You kind of expanded. And I've seen lots of other people have that same experience and really shut down and get tight. And mm. I think maybe somewhere in that is where Jesus is. Mm. But that doesn't make you that doesn't make you the hero of the piece, just in that that singular moment, by the way. 
Do you know what I mean? I mean, you could have shut down and gone another way. And I, and I also appreciate that, that, you know, that you're not saying that to say, oh, you know, great thing for you. No, I mean, that, and, and that's an important part. I, I think um, uh, whether you, you can't think of yourself as a savior no matter what. Oh, great that I figured it out. Oh, you know, great that I'm coming up with a solution. No, it's not, you, it's, it, it, it can't ever be from that place. It's, it's got to be from a much more humble uh, place. And, and part of that is, a, too, a, um, a, a willingness in, of uh, taking chances. And not, you know, you're like, I know, I know I'm going to make mistakes. I know I'm going to say something that's going to offend. And I'm just, all I can do is just say, I'm trying, you know, and right. oh, wow, I, you're right. I'm sorry. Let me, I hope that I'm not going to do that again and, 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 and not let that freeze me. Um, and yeah, Jesus is so challenging. Um, and, and I, I appreciate that. So friends, what I would like to propose, um, if you're game, we have, right at 30 minutes and feel free to come and go stay or leave whatever you need to do. Uh, we've been here about an hour. Uh, what I'd like to offer if y'all are up for it is to break us up into two smaller groups, uh, to discuss two questions I've got. And we've been talking a lot about how we as individuals hold these two things together, right? Um, our political convictions, uh, and what I'm proposing is the content of those convictions, um, you know, the teachings of Jesus, how we hold those together. Um, what I'd like to offer to you all are two questions I've put in the chat box here, and I'll read them to you. Um, what is the church's role in helping bridge this divide in our country? This and, you know, you hear it on every news station. We are as divided as we've ever been. Um, I don't know if that's true. You know, I'm not 300 years old. Um, and yet, we're as divided as, as we've been in my lifetime. Um, and what is the church's role? Is there something about, and Andrew, I think you were pointing to neighborliness. Is there something about neighborliness? That, that the church can point to as a way to bring these two poles back together? And that's kind of the second question. Uh, can and should the church offer a vision of what it means to be neighborly that binds us together regardless of political difference? Um, I'd like for us maybe to break up into some smaller groups and have maybe 15 minutes of conversation around those two questions, um, if you guys are amenable to that. I see. I, I see. I did, I have, Go ahead, Carol. Um, I, I, when we th say that we're neighbor, we've got to be really expansive with it because our neighbors are a exclusive group. I mean, that's what's happened to our neighbors. We live with people that are like us, so we've got to. Right expand our i think we need to expand our mind on that on that word absolutely absolutely and i think jesus would agree with you um he has several parables that point in that direction our neighbor is a uh, somali refugee child um, our neighbor is a widow in bangladesh uh, living in a slum you know our neighbor is the person across the street with a big donald trump sign in in his front yard you know, the, the, those are our neighbors. Um, so yes, and my hope, Louise, go ahead, yes. I was just gonna say, I also think the consequences of not being neighborly should, should be included because, because, and Joe, I know I, I told you this once, but the, I can't get this Nigerian proverb out of my head. It's one sentence, it says, the child who is not embraced by the village will burn it down to feel its warmth. Mm. The child who is not embraced by the village will burn it down to feel its warmth. And I think those are the consequences of not being neighborly. And I just wanted, whatever format we take or not, um, is that we look at some of the consequences of not being neighborly. We're seeing it now. I think that's great. 
I'm putting this up in the chat for us to ponder. Um, so let's let's go into breakout rooms. Um, I'm going to send us there, and we'll spend about 15 minutes there. Uh, let's wrestle some of these very good questions, uh, Carol, you and Louise raise, and come back together and share a little bit. And when you go into a breakout room, please create space for everyone to have an opportunity to reflect on these questions. Um, and before we come back together, um, let's let's try and figure out who is going to share for the group uh, with the bigger group. Okay, so um, here we go. Did you want me to go too? Yeah. Are you going? No. <laughs> Who am I in a breakout room with? Uh, Louise and Andrew. All right. Bye. Just checking. Have fun. offering and i think that that's a good one of there there could be there might be a place that you're critical of what the church is doing or um but what how does that what would how would you connect that to the contemporary politics the church's role well we don't have prohibition anymore although we still have some variants of it but we have got for instance the war on drugs, which has got, shall we say, a significant religious aspect to it as well, as far as I can tell. Like there, there aren't there aren't people like me around who view the war on drugs as a disaster and a failure that is harming the country. So, do you see a role that the church could or should be playing in that? I think so. Yes. I mean, like, what, would, what would that be? Speaking up and saying to people, this is not a workable proposition. It isn't helping our country for us to do these things to con uh, condemn and control people simply for using drugs. I mean, like my, like for instance, I have no approval of the use of heroin. But that doesn't mean that I want to see it prohibited. I want to see people led away from using that drug, yeah. not coerced in various ways and put into jails and that kind of thing. I mean, prohibition didn't work for alcohol and it's not working for the drug war. Those are just two things that we have, and you know, two things that some people are very much in favor of. Because they say, look at all the harm the heroin does to people. I'm thinking, yes, but that doesn't mean that your control freak approach is actually going to help deal with that problem. Yeah. Uh, one thing our church is, 
one thing that St. Mark's as a church has done in the past, which I think was neighborly, is, uh, for example, after, in, after Trump's election to the presidency on Inauguration Day, we put up signs welcoming people to come into our church build, build, of course, I just realized with the virus, this is irrelevant. But anyway, we did invite them in for coffee and to use the bathroom and have refreshments without regard to our agreement with their <laughs> political beliefs. So um, it, I think that's an example of things that we've done in the past as a church when we I don't know if we've had groups actually use our meeting space that we might not agree with with their viewpoints um, as long as they're not a violent group uh, advocate you know what I mean uh, I don't know if we've done that or not but anyway those were some thoughts going through my head <laughs> I, I remember um, uh, working that working that event and and, um, and, it, and it was great the next day too right or the a couple of days within a couple of days of the, the women's yeah, the march. Women came. Did, did, <laughs> in the little groups we belong to outside the church because we're carrying a lot of who we are and how we've been shaped by our church by our Christianity out uh, and and the, the shadings of differences or maybe the huge gaps among Christians to me aren't really important at the end of the day mm. um, you know it yeah it's like I remember when they were fussing about did Shakespeare really write it or was th those plays or was it the other guy well I don't care who wrote it it's terrific and, and and I think that arguing over some of this is is not modeling what we should be about which is bringing people together even when they are different, so different in their beliefs. Well, I know, I mean, right now I'm, now uh, it's like my sister is way on the other side. I recently got sent a text with a photograph of her from the Tallahassee Democrat at a little Trump Trump, it wasn't actually Trump, but it was somebody else, basically a rally of, you know, pro-Trump stuff. And she basically got right in the middle of the front of the picture. And I just thought, oh my gosh. And so ever since Tuesday, well, I mean, and she was also running for a local office in her county in North Florida. So ever since election day, I was like, well, I need to reach, you know, I, I'm going to have to call her. But I'm not going to call her until I know who won the election because <laughs> I just I don't want any of that anxiety. And that's like, a, but I've still been struggling with exactly how to truly really try to start a conference. And I think I'm actually kind of pulling off of some of the stuff we've been doing in the forgiveness class of how to actually let her talk and not feel like I've got to argue with her. And and I. Don't you know? Cause there was something in the thing that Joe put up in there, at the, sort of in the middle of that thing about something, but not judging. I don't, I don't remember exactly the wording, but it's like, how can I give her space to talk where it's not her preaching to me? Like, you know, it's all you know, she's right and I'm wrong kind of thing. So, and that's, and I feel like that's in a way what we should be kind of helping, how am I trying to say this? Like the church should uh, like help us figure out how to do this. Cause I, <laughs> cause I feel like I'm kind of going, I'm getting out into strange territory that I don't know exactly what I'm doing out there. So, so yeah. You know, it's interesting. One of the things I used to do is I would teach a Bible self-defense class and I would teach mm. it before the holidays um, in a lesbian bar in downtown Minneapolis and we'd have all these gay folks come in and it was about you know I am not going to argue the clobber passages with my friend Joe but when Joe starts to tell me that the Bible tells me that I'm a, I'm a sinner and that I'm evil one of the best things you can do is say oh hey Joe 
what's your favorite passage in the Bible? What is the favorite thing that Jesus said? And I will bet dollars to donuts. Well, I know that every time I've ever done that, we have a conversation about oh, feed the hungry, you know, be present. You know, it's all this Matthew 25 questions. They, nobody ever says, Leviticus, a man shall not lie down with another man, you know? And all, so all of a sudden, you just have one little way in, yeah. to, you know, do it. And instead of getting into a whole, well, why do you like that guy? You know, say, you know, what, what values does he reflect that, that are important yeah. to you? And, and, that's, and that's actually kind of what I've been thinking. I've, I've been sort of talking to myself for the last couple of days about, how to and I go well you know what does this mean to you or what's the what's its biggest you know what's the thing that's most important to you about the position or the platform and you know try to stay away from the individuals and the personalities as much as I can but I think I'd, I'd only push back slightly by saying that sometimes things are so traumatic that it only re-traumatizes you if you bring up certain things so that maybe right away we welcome um, them into our church that we're we're coming together to feel their pain and to come to an understanding of it it's i had a strange uh this is i, I guess uh, I don't even know why I'm saying this, but I had a strange realization in the past year about those gun violence meetings when suddenly, because I, I, I wasn't identifying with him, and then my mind turned and I said, what do you mean you've been a victim of gun violence yourself? You just haven't been shot, but you've ha been robbed twice where the person who was robbing you was holding a gun on you. You know, and I was like opening, I guess I'm a victim of gun violence, you know, and I hadn't really identified, but there are people out there who are victims that way too. I, I don't know why I stuck that in there. But anyway, we do have groups coming in that come from all different religious backgrounds and they're meeting around a particular issue. Uh, I can't say that I've been a victim of gun violence but I have been a victim of violence. When I was a grad student at Columbia University one evening, a man with a knife forced me into my apartment. And at one point said, I should be killing you because I'm not getting enough. I got him to go away. Uh, but this is the kind of thing where this man belonged in jail for what he did to me and presumably what he did to other people as well. Uh, and that's the kind of thing where I want to see us leading our society and but leading our society in better directions where people are, instead of trying to harm other people, are trying to help lead us in healthier, better directions, which is what I was doing even as a young man uh, with my work in a variety of fields. That, that's what I want to see as being, helping lead our society in a healthier, better direction. So that's, that's where I want to see us going. Okay, thank you. So that, that speaks really well to that question of what it means to be neighborly that binds us together, regardless of political differences. And Carol, your example, I think is perfect of gun control. Chuck, is there anything that um, you've experienced at St. Mark's that you that you feel um, does that, or that you think the church could be doing that it that just as you described um, addresses broader societal issues? I'm not sure. I think we want to just try to help people to have better, healthier, happier lives together, and approach people and say, "Oh, you mean this is really getting to you?" And I say, yes, like for instance, my current economic situation, I was forced into this uh, direction many years ago by abusive control freaks at work. And those control freaks, uh, uh, my and other people's opinions of 
them need these people need to be controlled they don't need to be controlling us so that's one of the things that i go through when i encounter this kind of a thing like uh i should still be working at um at a minimum i should still be working at nasa goddard using my talents to help that agency and that field do better things and accomplish better things instead of letting abusive bullies run wild and call them calling themselves professional <laughs> with their demands upon people is there an example of something at saint mark's as a church that could be a helpful thing or one of the things i like about uh saint mark's is the way that St. Mark's embraces the arts, whether it be the St. Mark's players, the St. Mark's dancers, or even the occasional exhibitions we do in the church, where we get to show something that is positive and beautiful and caring, et cetera, et cetera. That's something that I like participating in at St. Mark's. So you, so you're, so for you, it's very much a uh, what the space can provide for people that attend the church. That's one. That's and, and just one them. thing. Yeah. But there are other things yeah. people can be doing as well. Yeah. So friends, I'm going to invite us to rejoin the main group. Uh, Y'all are doing a great job. I've really enjoyed listening in. So. I look forward to the conversation in the main group here. Welcome back, welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back, friends. I know Michelle had somewhere to be. Um, let's see if we've got everybody. Uh, it's maybe, it's maybe all of us. Um, okay, so I am going to invite someone from each group just to hit the high points, if you would be so kind. Carol's coming back, so um, y'all, y'all, feel free to share some of the uh, insights your fellow group members uh, have offered and offer it to the rest of us, if you would. We had, we had a couple of very specific examples that um, felt uh, impactful to us, which was for um, helping to bridge the divide. Uh, there's the conversations about exploring, um, finding, making a connection with other churches in the diocese that we, that, that might have a more conservative um, bent and exploring, creating a space for, for conversation and understanding um, that you've got that commonality of, of, of church as a, as a starting point. Um, and uh, Carol offered, and I think it's just it's such a really good one for um, how uh, you can offer a space to, to bind neighbors. And, and, and we've, as a church, hard to do right now, um, created a space uh, for on an issue that brings together people from all different denominations and, and, and things like the, like the gun violence issue. Like there's, I'm sure people come from all different backgrounds for, for that, but uh, it was a great example. Um, or that we you know, opened the church as a space to, for um, the Trump inauguration as well as the Women's March. So just that's uh, having that uh, neighborliness in, in those ways. Thank you, Kit. Well, we 
were actually talking similarly, but not so much about talking to other church communities as how to talk to people in our families. <laughs> and so, I mean, it, it, and kind of talking about what tools can, you know, the church potentially give us as individuals even to just be able to listen and not judge, but, you know, I guess I get some like that, yeah. Uh, so, because I definitely, I definitely have a, a situation, you know, I, I need to do that <laughs> in my family. So that's kind of what, what I was focused on when we were talking. And it seemed like in our group, we kind of all have somebody in our family <laughs> that we need to be able to build a bit, of, you know, a, maybe more of a bridge to, you know, clear some of the divide. I have, to, I have to, I'm going to speak to, I, that I, I love that idea. I mean, in the same way, way that I'm participating in the sacred ground circles to explore issues that I want to understand more and want to be able to talk about more. And I, I haven't had the tools and the knowledge to be able to, and, and that's helping me with that, that I, I think that there's a need for that as a space as well to get, help get more tools. And honestly, that's one of the reasons I came to this session today, because I felt like that was sort of the topic and wanted to just keep talking and thinking and exploring and I think that that's a great idea. Well, Michelle, well, Michelle was in our group, so I, you know, I don't know what she'll do with it, but she heard it. She heard us. <laughs> she comes like, oh, okay. I'm not sure exactly what that would be, but yeah. And just to kind of push that point, I think those are all very good points. Um, Andrew, to push, the point your group was wrestling with a little further. Um, to what extent does that practice, and I'm going to put words in your mouth, and I'm sorry, but that practice of holy listening to those who maybe, you know, we don't exactly, where I'm from, we call it G Hall. We don't G Hall with, right? Um, to what extent does that holy listening? Uh, apply not just in our family dynamics, not even in our community dynamics, um, you know, with the Trump inaugurate, you know, whatever it may be, but to what extent does it apply within our immediate community at St. Mark's? Um, to what extent are there members in our midst who you know, maybe, maybe we don't hear as well as we could, or maybe we miss hear. Um, and I don't want to kick any hornet's nests, but um, I, just, I just want to, to reflect back what I'm hearing you all say at an immediate and a global level and invite us to think about in our own community. And are these things we can practice you know, in, in the safe space around the altar um, with folks we see every Sunday. Louise. You know, Joe, when you said holy listening, I wasn't sure how you were spelling holy. And it took me to a wonderful place, which is to listen holy in its entirety is what we also not just select, oh yeah, I like that pointer. Oh, I'm going to think about what I'm going to buy at this store. Uh, to holy ground, to holy listening. I don't know which you meant, but I, uh, holy listening is in community. We're really called in our own faith community, especially when we, as the Aussies say, get up each other's nose. What, what an image. I'm, I can't unsee that. But, um, you know, is, is that, is, is listening when we really hold such different views? And it is holy ground. Bringing our whole selves to a conversation, perhaps. Whatever the risk, Andrew. I'm sorry. Well, and also, and also, I guess there's the, you know, if I'm going to listen to somebody, then I want to be listened to, and at least in my case, I don't have a lot of confidence that I'm being listened to by the person that I would like to be able to listen to, and I think that's part of my struggle is, I'm going to listen to her, she ain't going to listen to me, and so what exactly are we, you know, that, that just feels like a waste of time to me because I already know most of what she's going to say. So I don't need to hear it again necessarily. 
but unless I can figure out some way to ask questions that are not just going to be tell me your political beliefs or something, you know, some some way to get at it that's not just a regurgitation of Fox News or whatever. So, um, when do you get together to do this listening? I have to admit something. It's I don't know how it's going to go across, but I don't do very well at the coffee hours. I love these Zoom telephone calls. I find the coffee hours at church, people are sitting in cliques at the tables. And I can't seem to break in, uh, despite the length of time I've been coming to the church. And those cliques are involved in the fact that they've known each other for years and they had children in Sunday school together and they've got these long-term relationships, which are all wonderful. That's one aspect. The other aspect is uh, they're there to do church business. So instead of you know meeting and just getting to know another church member who they rarely talk to, they're busy doing church business and they really don't want you to interrupt their doing a church business at the coffee house. So I have found, I was just wondering, when do you guys do all this listening? I have, I feel like I've had more opportunity on these Zoom calls to listen and get to meet people. It's been wonderful. Thank you. Do you, do you mean the Zoom coffee hours you've had more opportunity? Yes, and, yeah. and, the, and the class that, that we're taking uh, on sacred ground and this Zoom call. Yeah, yeah, all of it. Yeah. That's such, uh, that, that's such a beautiful invitation for us to rethink how we act once we're in some parallel universe, when we're physically back in to coffee hour together, to really, really, what you're saying is so powerful, Carol. I couldn't, I know exactly what you mean. When I was senior warden, every pub lunch, I made sure I sat at a table with people I didn't know. That was a commitment. You can't have a presence if, if you don't, you can't be a leader if you don't know everyone around and welcoming new people, especially new people. I'd see them when they were in, introduce themselves and follow them into pub lunch. And that's not coffee hour, I appreciate. But, you know, it's just so important. Thank you for that. I took a lot of, uh, a lot of courage. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, and, and, you're, and you're not alone in, in, in having had that feeling for sure. And I, I will, Joe, I wanted to share with you at coffee hour today, um, uh, the, the most powerful part of the moment was a conversation that as a full group before we did the smaller groups um, was, was exactly on that topic of someone expressing how people can sometimes feel intimidated or even shut down when speaking and then there isn't there isn't always that openness at St. Mark's and that there's so much assumption of shared beliefs that should mm. not exist. And, and it was, it was, there was a very vibrant conversation about that and, and, and needing to be aware of that and make space. So. And, and that's good. Thank you, Kit. I'm just going to highlight the fact that we're after time. Um, I want to honor your time and thank you for spending it with us um, today on what I think is is a very critical time for us as church whatever that means to you um and i am very glad to hear the conversations that are happening uh in our community because i do think for all the challenges of this pandemic um there is gift in that we are seeing places where we can be better to ourselves and be better to each other. Um, and I just hope as you all have pointed to, we can create space to allow that to happen. Um, you guys have given me a lot to think about, a lot to uh, chew on, and, uh, and I'm grateful for that. It's all been gift. Uh, I hope this conversation doesn't end here and now. Hope you'll take these thoughts out and wrestle them on your own and bring them back into spaces that we will create, Carol, uh, for more intimate, seriously, for more intimate uh, conversation, um, you know, and continue to wrestle these, these issues as a community. So uh, I don't want to have the last word. Uh, does anyone have something pressing they, they feel must be said or should be said? 
Well, I just want to say that Andrew and I used to be in a group, and we got opportunity to talk from our hearts, and that was our book discussion group. So I just want to acknowledge Andrew. <laughs> anyway. And we are very blessed, Kit, to have you with us, and I trust you will take some of these ideas and thoughts back to the vestry. And um, at, 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 and and Andrew, Andrew, as well. Andrew yes. <laughs> So we have two vestry persons in our midst, um, and you've got a very low-level uh, wannabe clergy person. I guess I'm technically a clergy person. But anyway, uh, I will offer this uh, some feedback as well in our clergy meeting uh, this coming week. Um, and I just I want to thank you all. You all are such a gift and, uh, to me, to my family, and I hope to each other. And uh, I would invite you to go out and be gift to someone else today and this week. So uh, you all have a very blessed week and uh, be well. Thank you. Kit. Louise, it was good to see you. <laughs> Kit, I want to tell you something. I went to Kingsman Island on your recommendation. Oh, great. I went, I went this week, yeah. Great. I'm glad you went. Thanks so much, Joe. Bye, everybody. Goodbye.